I'm Steven Svoboda. I'm the Executive Director of Attorneys for the Rights of the Child. I'm here because this is an important symposium. Once every two years, we get together from all over the world and talk about our work, which is to protect genital integrity for children, for boys, for girls, for intersex people, to keep their bodies, the bodies they were born with. And if they decide as adults they want to change their bodies, that's up to them. But the point is to get them to adulthood with their bodies intact, unless there's a medical necessity to change them, which there very rarely is. Most, most claims of that are actually not correct. And we're very biased in the U.S. in favor of male circumcision, which is really sad. And what I'm here for is, as my role in ARC, I've been doing a lot of work translating a lot of documents from around the world, cases, law review articles, and we're building the case that male circumcision is already illegal, not only in the U.S., which it is, but also in other countries, in Europe, in Germany, which had a 2012 major legal decision in Cologne, another really important one last year, 2013, in Hamm, Germany. And there's been some legislation that attempted to overturn that. That legislation is unconstitutional. We're going to build a case. We're going to take it to the United Nations, and we're going to show that male genital integrity, female genital integrity, and intersex genital integrity have to be respected, and that's human rights. Everybody's covered by human rights. It doesn't matter if you're a child, you're old, you're black, you're white, you're Latina, you're homosexual, you're heterosexual, you don't know what your sexuality is. It doesn't matter. You're covered. You're a human being. Now, there's a uh, famous photograph of you uh, uh, testifying at, at, in front of the United Nations. That's right. We, we had a team that went to the UN in 2001, put, it, put the issue on the UN record for the first time in a document centrally addressing male circumcision as a human rights issue. Now, since then, there's been a lot of progress. The UN is actually getting much more favorably inclined toward this issue. There's been a lot of developments in 2013, 2014 by our European colleagues, um, the Secular Medical Forum and, and other folks that, with, with whom we work closely. And we're planning to go back to you at UN. We think the time is right. A lot of new thinking has evolved since 2001. A lot of more awareness, expanding human rights. Human rights are being applied to corporations now. At least there's movements in that direction. We're not just sticking to the so-called bread and butter, civil and political rights. You can't be tortured. Everybody knows that. You can't be killed. Everybody knows that. There's a much broader range of human rights now. And this is all a legacy from the post-World War II situation where people wanted to make amends and make sure this would never happen again. And Germany had a new constitution that was put in in 1949, a new order, new legal order that led to the Cologne and Hamm decisions. It's a direct line to the protection of genital integrity, bodily integrity, by the German courts, and that's an important development. Uh, I, I talked to a uh, German legal scholar, uh, Holm Putzke, this morning, and... Who was the co-author of, my, of the, my presentation here in Boulder, by the way. Wonderful, wonderful. And uh, he came right out and told me that despite the uh, new German law, that he considers uh, baby circumcision a criminal assault upon a child. Well, it was held to be a criminal assault. The Cologne court was extremely careful to base its decision on the Constitution not on anything that was subject to being overturned by the appellate court. So they issued a rock-solid decision. And there's really nothing that can be done about it. I mean, the German government felt a lot of political pressure, was shamed, essentially, due to the sad history from the Holocaust, World War II, was shamed into committing further human rights violations by passing a law that purports to allow religious circumcision. It's not legal in Germany. It wasn't legal before the Cologne case, but the Cologne case confirmed it's not legal. The Hamm case confirmed that. And this law is contrary to the Constitution. There are four reasons I talked about. I mean, I didn't make them up initially myself. I mean, I had a lot of German colleagues that I worked with. But there's four independent reasons, any one of the four of which is good enough to invalidate this German law. It, it's just not going to work. I mean, the religious factions, and I mean, I'm, my family's Jewish. I mean, my, my son's going through bar mitzvah right now. I mean, it's not like we're against religion. I'm pro-religion. But it's not about religion at all. It's about protecting the human rights of children. If you want to grow up and you want to cut... Any, you know, you want to have a circumcision done, more power to you if you're a consenting adult. But there's no seven-day-old Jews. There just aren't any. There are seven-day-old sons of Jewish parents, but there are no seven-day-old Jews, and you have no business cutting their skin. And that is what the Cologne and Hamm courts say.
Stephen, what do you think will be the uh, next legal step uh, in the United States? Do you see anything uh, on the horizon? Well, that's an interesting question. There was a 2006 uh, Oregon Supreme Court case that actually held that the child, in this case it was an older child, it was 14 I think at the time, was held to have the right to have input into his own um, treatment in terms of whether to be circumcised or not. And that was a very important case taking place in the U.S. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of cases going on. David Llewellyn, who's a board member of ours, is very active, very talented, extremely committed individual. He's just been bringing these cases for, I think it's over 20 years now. And he's been making a lot of progress. The cases do tend to mostly be so-called botches, which means mostly cases in which more went wrong than the average case. But I, people need to understand that every case is a botch because it's done without a medical indication. And William Stoll, in fact, got a settlement for an undisclosed amount. David's not allowed to disclose it. He'd probably like to, but he can't under the terms of the settlement. In 2002, I think it was, um, saying that, look, you're a child. It's not a botch, and it's, there's not a lack of consent. Now, there were some con consent problems with William Stoll, actually, but the case wasn't based on that. So it's not a lack of consent. It's not a botch, and you're still entitled to compensation. That was what that case held. And that is what U.S. case law is going to end up holding as German case law is already corroborated. We're getting there. It, it may be a year, it may be five years, but we're getting there. I have uh, two questions right now I'd, I'd like to ask you. Uh, what's your take on the prospects uh, in Germany? I know it's a, it's a stretch to ask you to speculate, but what is your take, uh, being uh, you know, knowing so many of the personalities involved, what is your take on the prospects of the uh, German law uh, being declared unconstitutional? Well, to be declared unconstitutional, the only likely scenario, there's three scenarios, as I talked about two days ago here in my talk, but the only likely scenario is if a case comes in in which it's declared um, legal based on the law, and then there's an appeal based on that, and then the, case, the constitutionality of the law has to be decided. Because otherwise, the constitutionality of the law is not squarely involved. There's two other scenarios, but they're less likely. So that's the, by far the most likely scenario. There's a pretty good chance of that happening. A uh, pretty good chance. I mean, Germany has a small but still sizable um, Jewish contingent, a very sizable Muslim contingent, and the chances that a case is going to be brought, I think it's pretty likely, actually. And, you know, whatever the political views are of, of the um, judges making the decision, the law is clear. And, I mean, the arguments that have been made have, have been very weak legal. I mean, people try to argue that the right to care and custody under Article 6 of the Constitution allows you to, as a parent to order the um, circumcision, but that's completely wrong. I mean, the, the right to care and custody is only provided to care for the child. You're not allowed to do that for your own interest. It's completely contrary to the whole principles which were set up based on Immanuel Kant's thinking. The great thinker, Immanuel Kant, they enshrined that. The Allies went in there and enshrined that after World War II, and that is based on German belief, long-held belief. So that, there's no way around that. It's rock solid. And uh, my other question is, what is your uh, idea regarding the separation in some human rights communities, the separation of the uh, two, uh, a, a female genital mutilation from male genital mutilation? Oh, well, it's completely outrageous, and it's very stark in Germany, because Germany passed a law against female genital cutting, which was unnecessary, because it was already illegal. But, I mean, this happened in the U.S. in many states, and in federal federal government, many other countries also, where it's already illegal as an assault, but they passed a specific law. I mean, we, we also oppose female genital cutting, just as fervently as we oppose male genital cutting, and we have worked very hard on that at Attorneys for the Rights of the Child, too. Our main reason for focusing on the male is there's fewer organizations working on that issue, but they're, they're definitely equally important. The thing about it is, is it's so stark because Germany passed a law saying that female genital cutting is illegal. In fact, I was on my flight home from my last talk on this topic a year ago while this law was being passed. At the same time, they passed a statute purporting to say that male circumcision is legal. The problem is that there are some forms of male circumcision that are actually worse than some forms of female circumcision. And there are certainly forms of male circumcision that are comparable to certain forms of female circumcision. Nobody can deny that. Now, you can argue until you're blue in the face about, oh, well, this form is 60% worse than this form, and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Human rights does not say you can cut off somebody's one joint off somebody's finger if somebody else is having their leg cut off and they're being tortured for six days. It doesn't make the smaller violation okay. Human rights does not operate that way, unless it's de minimis, unless it's like cutting off one hair off somebody's head or something. It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry. It will not stand. Uh, it, 
one other uh, question comes to mind. Uh, you recently uh, debated uh, some of the uh, members of the uh, 2012 AAP Circumcision Task Force in, uh, I believe it was in South Carolina? This is true, yes. And uh, you got a stark, uh, a startling, stark and startling admission from uh, one of the uh, chief uh, authors of the uh, report. Uh, I believe that was Michael Brady who made that comment. Would you just briefly review that with us? Well, Brady had a few surprising things. I'm guessing what you're referring to is he actually admitted twice that no one knows the functions of the foreskin. Now, now here's a physician that is on the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force. He is supporting this somewhat wishy-washy claim that the AAP made that circumcision is justified. And he's telling us that nobody knows the functions of the foreskin. Well, shouldn't he find that out before he proposes cutting it off? And the, the other fascinating piece of information is that the AAP says in their position statement that nobody has really determined the harms of circumcision. And yet they still try to say that the benefits exceed the harms. Well, how can you say the benefits exceed the harms if you don't know what the harms are? Then they came in later and said, oh, well, really what we meant was we felt that the harms ex uh, were exceeded by the benefits. I, what you, these are doctors talking about their feelings. Mm -hmm. about, you got to do science. You've got to find out the answer. And besides that, they didn't include in their harm the loss of the actual tissue. Well, this is pretty much a dull level of medicine we're talking about. I mean, if I, if I want to cut off your arm, I mean, don't we have to think about like what function does the arm have? Mm -hmm. Not only are you going to bleed or are you going to go into shock, but maybe the arm has a function in your life. Maybe you want that arm. The same thing with the foreskin. It has protective, erogenous, and immunological functions. You have no business cutting that off. No business whatsoever. As far as you know, does anyone at the AAP, and this would uh, be chiefly among them, uh, Michael Brady, do they have a plan to answer the question that they weren't able to answer to your face? Well, do, do they have a plan, as far as you know, to find out or, or to acknowledge the function and structure of the, of the human foreskin? Well, I want to say first it was a great team victory. We had Peter Adler there. He's ARC's legal advisor. We had uh, Aubrey Taylor there and Angel Tarone. They all four did a fantastic job. And we collectively left the American Academy of Pediatrics unable to respond to us for non-physicians. And they literally told us, we cannot answer anything you're saying. We cannot reply to you. And they had five minutes to talk on Saturday, and they only used one of their minutes, basically just to say that. And so they are speechless. They haven't told us how they're going to not become speechless. They haven't told us how they're going to finally quantify the harms of circumcision. They haven't told us anything. They don't know what is going on, and that statement is frankly embarrassing. And let me say this also. My wife is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics. They are a great organization, other than this completely bizarre position they have on male circumcision. They are a good organization, so this is not about bashing the AAP, but we have to get beyond this strange American phenomenon of treating male circumcision so oddly and strangely. We, we have to get beyond this and protect the children. It has to be done. We stand for liberty. We stand for freedom. We stand for what's right. We have to make good on that pledge. We have to show the world. We can't be going to Europe and trying to show them how to observe human rights, as people have been talking about recently. There's legislation pending. We can't do that if we don't have our act cleaned up at home. We've got to clean up our act at home first for the sake of the children. So the, as far as you know, there, the, the AAP has no plan to, uh, find, to find out the, the structure and function. You know what? I, I could as far as you know. I could pretty categorically say they have no plan because this debate was organized. They had plenty of advance warning. Susan Blank, continued this, who's the head of the AAP Task Force on Circumcision, continued this pattern she has of basically never showing up when she's asked to come defend the AAP's position. So they managed to talk Michael Brady into doing it. He's an immunologist. I, I'm I'm an an immunologist. He's not an immunologist. Stephen, thank you very much much for your work with attorneys for the rights of the child, and uh, I know you're in this for the long haul. I'm in for the long haul. I want to say one more thing. I want to say the people on the street are doing good work. Brother K, Jonathan Friedman, Bloodstained Men, there's many other organizations. I don't mean to just single them out, but they're, and AP individual people aren't in organizations. They're out there. They're on the street. They're, they're letting the public know that people care about this, because it's public education. It's public awareness. The law does not unilaterally change magically to make the world a better place without a political movement coming first. The civil rights movement was a possible one exception in our history. And those courageous men and women are out on the street working hard and changing things. And my hat is off to them. And, and I'm, I'm pleased to uh, report that uh, you're going to be on the street with us in Denver uh, either tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. I'll be there on Monday. Wonderful, wonderful. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Stephen Swoboda. Thank you. Attorneys for the Rights of the Child. Thank you.